Justice Global Order. I'm Hindul Sen Gupta Kum Carpentier de Godo joins me today to talk about the fiasco that unfolded in France and the repercussions of that fiasco after the Olympics opening ceremony on the country and its progress in the months and years to come. Also, we will take on Germany, where mosques are being, uh, you know, in a sense, being charged with police battalions who are closing, shutting down some major mosques because of allegations of their links to terror and um, Islamism. And of course, then we will move to the UK, where Anjum Chaudhary, the notorious Islamist, has been put, finally been put behind bars. Many people would say too little, too late, and conclude, of course, with what's happening in Israel. Netanyahu's own position, uh, you know, infirm in many ways, but of course, Ishmael Hania, the leader of Hamas, is now dead, bombed by Israel in the heart of Tehran. All of this with Kom Carpentier Gardodo. Thanks, Kom. Thanks very much for your time. Most welcome. Good evening, Hindu. Kom, let me begin then by asking you about France. You know, you are French, so we have to begin with France. And even though peens and peens have been written about that, I don't even know what to say about that Olympic opening ceremony. We have to put it to you. What are the long-term repercussions, Kom, of the spectacular uh, spectacle? Many would say grotesque spectacular spectacle uh, that we saw in the Olympic uh, opening ceremony. Long-term repercussions, not the repercussions today, but long-term repercussions on French society, its idea of rejection of religion, hard-nosed rejection of religion, its relationship with Christianity, with Islam, and of course, its idea that it's this great secular space in the world. Uh, as you know, and as you just said, there has been tremendous amount of discussion and controversy. And uh, from uh, Donald Trump to the government of Iran, to the Chinese government, to African heads of state, to and uh, you know the Catholic clergy, the Orthodox Church of Russia, and go so on and so on, you will find that uh, this ceremony or function was considered totally inappropriate and totally unsuited to the spirit of the Olympics, which is supposed to be uh, fraternal, non-controversial, universal, and uh, attractive to all, including children. Now, this, of course, was turned into a sort of a re-edition of, uh, you know, some of those typical functions we have now, such as gay pride parades, which have become gay pride weeks and gay pride month, and then uh, also what you now see at the Eurovision. And this was obviously seen as an extremely uh, inappropriate and deliberately provocative event because they knew that the eyes of the world would be uh, glued onto the screens and a majority of people uh, would be Christians, uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, and members of all the other religions. And I must say that among a number of uh, Indian Hindus that I talked to in the last couple of days, many of them were also shocked and dismayed by the spirit of the show, even though Hindus should not feel concerned, uh, and in some cases should even feel smugly uh, I would say they're risingly happy that uh, even Christianity is being mocked uh, because we all know that Hinduism has taken a lot of criticism over the last, uh, not only over the last years, but over the last centuries. Uh, but still, they felt that it was uh, disrespect to a religion easily means disrespect to all. And the spirit of the, the organizer of this event, which clearly had the approval of the highest level of power, including President Macron, was to show that France has no taboos and that it can do anything it wants. Uh, as they said, the organizers claimed, you know, here anybody can do anything. There is no uh, limit to freedom, which is of course not true because we all know that there are pretty strict limits to freedom in many areas. After all, the government has been cracking down on television networks and on uh, talk shows on uh, the internet, on uh, YouTube channels that they are regarded as too critical of the current dispensation. So uh, freedom has its limits, as everywhere else. But in terms of uh, wantonness, uh, they feel that any, anything is all right. you know. And uh, as a result, a number of countries blocked the, the show. Uh, others uh, expressed uh, formal complaints. And uh, there has been, as a result, an apology from the International Olympic Committee and then from the Paris Organizing Committee saying they didn't mean to offend. 
and they uh, took the show out of YouTube. But what was also very typical of the attitude of these people is that they claimed then that they had never meant to represent a sacred in uh, Christian scene, which is the Last Supper, but that they were in fact referring to some Greek uh, feast connected to Dionysos or Bacchus. And this is clearly false because they had themselves boasted in the beginning that they were doing that. And then they tried to explain that, no, we didn't mean that this was completely unrelated and you Christians are just overly sensitive. Uh, this, of course, and then they put in the place of Christ a, a woman called Barbara Butch, uh, well-named. And uh, the organizer himself is somebody called Thomas Jolie, uh, who has a very, very undistinguished career. He's a, basically a very small local or provincial theater director who staged a few shows in small theaters, and he was suddenly made into the organizer of this enormous event. And the historian who was chosen to uh, outline the scenario, as far as the historical uh, context is concerned, he's somebody called Patrick Boucheron, who is the very far left, and who said that his idea was not to show anything of French history that would be heroic, patriotic, and virile but all the opposite. And there we see the typical attitude of a big part of the left, which is that you should basically demean and destroy anything which is nationalistic or patriotic, because it uh, gives people ideas of self-sacrifice and of uh, communion with others, which is bad, because people should just be individualistic and should have no sense of uh, identity. They should just be uh, actors on a global market. And in fact, interestingly, even Mélenchon, the leader of the far left, has protested and said that it was wrong to humiliate and offend the Catholics and the Christians and the believers, and that he didn't see why militant atheists or uh, secularists should attack the beliefs and the symbols of uh, religion. So you see that even within that uh, general leftist uh, galaxy, there are uh, dissent, there, are, there is dissent, and clearly, a lot of politicians feel that it is not good for them because it turns a lot of people against them. In fact, I believe that uh, one never can predict, uh, as they say, you cannot predict uh, and even less the future. But I still feel that this will have a major impact on French society because on the one hand, it may polarize again more than it is already between the left and the right. But it will also, uh, in my view, create a general backlash against the whole woke ideology, which has become a form of dictatorship now, because these people are in positions of power. We all know that Macron uh, is very much a supporter. In fact, Macron said in various occasions that uh, he uh, was, uh, in, he wanted to protect the right to blaspheme, you know, that blasphemy was part of French uh, policy and polity, and that it could never be uh, punished. Now, this is very paradoxical because on the other hand, France is uh, clearly giving welcome to a lot of Muslims whose religious uh, tenets and uh, beliefs are obviously completely opposed to the idea of uh, free blasphemy. And as a result, it is turning them possibly even more against the French state. And this is already visible in the reactions from a number of Muslim clergies in France and outside France. So one is sometimes wondering, what are these people wanting to do? You know, it seems they are trying to impose their woke ideology, yet they want to humor the Muslims. And of course, they would never have dared to attack either Judaism or Islam uh, in a satirical form, because they know that this would have been totally unacceptable. But uh, they feel they have a free reign with Christianity. And as a result, they are making a lot of people who belong to the majority community, whether they practice or not, feel that they are being humiliated and they are being uh, put at a disadvantage in a way on a lower level than people who are members of religious minorities. So I think we will see an intensification of the fight between various communities, between the right and the left. And a lot of prominent people have put the blame on the, the left and on its destructive ideologies. And I think as a result, the conservative thought will get a boost. Obviously, people who have uh, opposite opinions will not change in, usually, but uh, those who are already on the fence, you know, who are wondering uh, what direction to take, they will certainly be uh, made to think that something is going very wrong and that if they don't stand for their culture and their country, 
both might be on the way to disappearing. Let's talk a little bit about what happens next. Um, you know, the country was already in such deep turmoil, uh, already politically so divided. Uh, do you think in some senses this has finally nailed the coffin into a deeply dis divided society already torn apart by politics? Yes. Uh, you know, the other day I was talking to a friend who is uh, high placed in the AXA insurance company, which is one of the largest in the world. Uh, based in Paris, although he's of Indian origin. And he was telling me that uh, he feels that now the, the country is in real trouble because uh, what he calls a zombie government, that's a caretaker government, a minority government that is currently uh, in place, that is leading uh, capital to flee the country. And uh, a lot of people have expressed grave doubts and uncertainty about the future of France. So uh, given the political uh, trouble, the political instability and the economic fragility of the country, you can expect uh, very serious trouble in years to come, even in months to come. Uh, a bit like what you see in England. You have seen probably that the new uh, uh, Secretary of Finance, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer of Britain, has said that she was appalled to see the state of the British economy and how bad it was and how uh, major measures might have to be announced, including a sharp rise in taxes and a sharp uh, cut in social services. France is going in the same direction and very unpopular measures will have to be taken uh, that uh, clearly will not make any government's uh, job easy because you can expect uh, large unrest. And here I'm getting to one of the other sides of the Olympics that has also been widely publicized. It is the level of uh, sabotage and unrest that has taken place. Uh, there has been, of course, an attempt to accuse the Russians, but this turned out not to be true. It's, it seems that uh, both the sabotage of the trains, as well as the sabotage of the electronic networks, of the telephone networks, and some other events that took place, such as the Home Minister getting a, an envelope full of plague uh, bacteria powder, uh, which means that there is now a massive alert on all uh, government offices uh, for the possibility of uh, a viral attack, of a biological attack. All that shows that uh, there is a real danger inside the country uh, due to the rise of the far left. People have accused the far right, and some of those people in the far right might indeed uh, carry out attacks on certain communities or on certain institutions. But by and large, the terrorism comes from the far left. And now uh, the far left has been given a boost from the last elections because they feel that they have a chance at taking power. And after uh, claiming that they are entitled to running the country for the last uh, few weeks, now they have self-persuaded themselves. They have persuaded themselves that they are indeed being robbed of power. And as a result, uh, there are inc insistent calls for direct militant action, which means to somehow uh, intimidate the country into giving them power. And of course, they want to freeze prices. They want to uh, escalate taxes. They want to go after the overseas uh, money that belongs to French citizens. They have a number of very fairly radical demands. And uh, Macron has been playing with them. He has been sort of boosting them in order to keep the far right or the, let's say, the hard right in check. And now he has to deal with the consequence of his actions, which means that he has to deal with the possible explosion of left-wing terrorism uh, in, in France. Let's move to Germany for a moment, Com, where... Uh, again, a society in turmoil. Some of Germany's oldest churches in the last couple of days uh, have been, you know, raided by police. Many of them have been shut down, in including Boston one. Churches. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, many of uh, Germany's uh, most, um, you know, old mosques have been raided by police. Uh, have been shut down, including a couple of famous ones. Uh, there are raids in mosques across Germany. Uh, you know, the, the German police are talking about old Islamist connections 
across mosques in Germany. Uh, there are all kinds of, you know, uh, measures that haven't been applied in Germany for a long, long time, which seem to be happening now. And I, I, I want to connect this, what's happening in Germany, with what's happening in uh, the UK. Finally, Anjim Chaudhary, you know, after perhaps, you know, this is perhaps um, uh, some should have been done a decade ago, has finally been put behind bars for life, but he'll probably never get out of prison while he's alive. But too little, too late, many people think. Do you think it's too little, too late, both in Germany and in England, as far as Islamism is concerned? I just wonder about the efficacy of such measures, because on the one hand, the Labour government in Britain is known to be uh, very much in need of Muslim votes. And as a result, they have pandered uh, to, or at least uh, ignored, a number of radical uh, Muslim groups and legislators uh, on the, you know, on the basis that they have a free uh, a right to free expression, and in Germany too, uh, there has been uh, almost indiscriminate acceptance of immigrants from Muslim countries. And I don't know if you're aware that a few weeks ago, the man who is in charge of uh, the protection of the constitution, in the sense he is a legist, he is a, legist a jurist, who is in charge of deciding what is and what is not in harmony with the German constitution. And he gave an opinion saying that uh, although far right was unacceptable, and of course there is what is far right and where does it begin to be far right. But on the other hand, he said the ideal of a caliphate, of a Muslim caliphate, is politically acceptable and viable. Now, he left it pending whether this was also applicable in Germany, in the sense whether talking of instituting a caliphate in Germany uh, was all right. But the fact that he said that the caliphate is a legitimate political aim and vision uh, made it clear that he was more worried about the far right than about uh, Islamic radicalism. Uh, and in fact, if you are talking about the mosque and the fact that they are reacting to certain uh, specific threats, but then if you look at the crackdown on uh, political parties and organizations in Germany, they have banned uh, magazines and uh, websites. They have, uh, they are desperately trying to find ways of banning the alternative for Deutschland, which is now the leading opposition party, since you might say that all the major establishment parties are together pretty much. Uh, and therefore, you can see that uh, there is nothing very democratic about all that. What's probably happening with the mosques in Germany is that as a result of the Israel, Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, etc. conflict, a number of uh, calls for uh, retaliation against Jewish interests have been given from certain agencies in the Middle East, and that these agencies have also obviously targeted or would like to target the major supporters of Israel, who happen to be Germany, uh, apart from the US, as well as Britain, of course, and <laughs> France. So the objective of targeting, of inflicting pain on the societies that are supporting Israel has led to a crackdown. Now, clearly, crackdowns are needed sometimes when you perceive an imminent terrorist threat. Whether they can avoid them, I don't know. And what has happened recently with the assassination of Haniye and the assassination of another of a Hezbollah leader in uh, Lebanon uh, certainly will expose Israel and its supporters to uh, retaliations, uh, and we don't know where and when. But I do expect a lot of bloodshed. And of course, the problem is that since uh, its enemies in the Middle East cannot destroy Israel, and in Israel cannot destroy them, this can go on uh, forever, almost. You know, I mean, one doesn't see any clear solution because it's in that cycle that we know so well in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean, which is vendetta, you know, you kill so-and-so, I kill uh, one of your relatives. And it goes on and on, and sometimes it goes on for centuries. And at this point, with a completely uh, incompetent American government, which has lost control of everything, you cannot expect any kind of uh, clear uh, solution to be brought out. Uh, that's why even those of us who have no particular trust in uh, Trump feel that it would be better if he's elected because he would have a clear will, whether successful or not, but he would certainly use all means at his disposal to bring uh, these wars to an end. Whereas the any administration led by, at this point it seems, by Kamala Harris, 
would almost certainly continue the policies uh, at present, uh, which are you know enforced by the group that advises uh, uh, President uh, Biden, or rather that acts in his name, because I don't think he knows what's going on. Uh, the fact is that these policies would continue and they don't bring solution to anything. In fact, they make things worse because they supply weapons to all sides and uh, they just let people kill each other forever. Wonder what is the repercussions of all of this um, in the wider sort of, you know, unity of the EU in its fight against Russia? Could you reflect upon that? Clearly, the EU is increasingly divided about it. And the re-election of Ursula von der Leyen, who is known to be a warmonger, has uh, made things worse. Because now you have uh, at least 35 to 40 percent of the European Parliament who is uh, against her and in uh, especially her policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, which are clearly a policy of endless war of attrition uh, at the cost of Ukrainians, because her whole idea, uh, and this is a part of the establishment in Germany, that feels that uh, if Russia is weakened, somehow Germany can get a revenge from World War II. You see, there is a deep uh, state in Germany, which is very much unreformed Nazi, and they are still uh, dreaming of a revenge against Russia. So they are using... Uh, Ukraine as a sort of a battering ram. And uh, if they are not stopped on that path, uh, they will carry on uh, because they have the support of the US. And as you know, Germany is really not interested in an autonomous European policy. They are interested in uh, keeping their economy going while relying on the US for protection. And they feel this is the safest course for them. So. Uh, Definitely, many countries, especially the smaller countries of Eastern and Central Europe, are becoming very hostile to the German policy, which they perceive as very imperialistic. And uh, they also, of course, like most people, have double games. Because if you look at Poland, Poland claims to be totally anti-Russian and pro-Ukrainian, but in fact, they are trading with Russia. And they are actually quietly planning to annex the west of Ukraine. Because they feel that once the east of Ukraine uh, will have been accepted as part of Russia, which is pretty much inevitable now, they will get uh, to recover the parts of Ukraine that belong to them historically. Because as you know, Ukraine is an artificial state. It was cobbled together and it was the victory of Stalin in World War II, which enabled Russia to claim territories that had been part of Germany, the Austrian Empire and Poland. So Poland definitely expects to get some benefit out of this. And as a result, uh, the agendas are completely divergent. And I think the European Union is now uh, in the throes of a growing economic crisis, as well as a sense of political uh, decline, which has been very well described by a number of very prominent uh, social and political scientists, including Emmanuel Todd, who is probably the most uh, illustrious living political scientist in France, who has said that uh, the EU is committing suicide and will uh, become a minor player in global affairs if it doesn't change course. I'm glad you came to global affairs and changing course because uh, one of the things that I, I want to end this conversation with, and of course one can't help but uh, conclude with this, is of course what's happening in uh, Israel and um, you know and in the battle between Israel and Hamas uh, in Gaza and now of course in the north with Hezbollah uh, and we are talking only hours after it was announced and you know I think this has sent shock waves across the Middle East across the world that Ishmael Hania the uh, you know uh, the the most important leader of Hamas was targeted and killed uh, in his own residence uh, in the heart of Tehran. Now, there is one thing to target and kill, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a, a rival or an opponent in, say, Lebanon or some other territory, but to do it in the heart of Tehran, even as a new government is coming in place in Tehran, uh, you know, this seems like something that many people would consider a provocation. And yet it has been done. And in fact, in the Hamas leadership, uh, Ishmael Hani has gone, uh, you know, the, you know, Mohammed Daif is gone. In fact, the only two most important leaders that are left, one is Khaled Mashal, he's of course left, and there's Yahya Shinwar and his brother Mohammed. They are the only three people that are left. 
everybody else in the top leadership of Hamas is dead. All of this seems to suggest to many people, Kob, that a wider war that everybody was afraid of from day one is about to happen and spill across the Middle East. And yet some people believe quite on the contrary, Israel's targeted interventions is actually stopping this spillover. Where do you stand in this debate, Kob? What do you think is going to happen? You know, the fact is that Israel has been assassinating uh, hostile individuals, uh, leaders in various parts of the world for years. So there is no great novelty there. Uh, Hamas has a history of uh, changing its leaders as soon as one is uh, put down. Uh, others come up because they have this structure which enables somebody to be immediately replaced by somebody else who is probably not widely known, but who has been groomed and trained. This is their fundamental strategy because as a militant or terrorist organization, you know, what's a terrorist? Uh, they have developed that uh, formal structure for a long time. So in my view, Israel's attack is a again a, a very uh, dangerous gamble. Netanyahu is a gambler. He, at this point, he feels he doesn't have much to lose. And he hopes that if Iran retaliates massively, which I think Iran may have to do in one way or another, because this is a provocation equal to, or almost equal to the destruction of their consulate in uh, Syria, in uh, Damascus, which killed some Iranian uh, officers, uh, including a general. So how will Iran retaliate? We don't know. But the fact is that Russia has made it clear that uh, Iran would not be attacked without Russia providing it with defense. And recently, there have been agreements between Syria, Iran, and Turkey. And Turkey has also stated, for whatever it's worth, that they may, in fact, enter Israel to fight in defense of the Palestinians. Now, that may seem like an idle threat, but my view is that Israel is calculating that if they can provoke a major escalation, the US will have to come to their aid. And in a way, they are betting on a war between US and Iran. You know, this is another form of what Israelis define as a Samson strategy. You know, that if we feel we are in mortal peril, then let the whole world fight over us. And hopefully we will win. And uh, that's about uh, what you can say about this. Because clearly, as long as Israel is fighting alone with huge amounts of help from the West, but still they have to deal with, uh, you know, a, several fronts and they have very limited resources. So uh, they have to somehow uh, call upon uh, massive uh, US intervention. And that's what they are hoping for. Now, the question is, uh, US will probably not move too much before the elections, although they may strike uh, just to show, uh, you know, it would be a way for the current administration in America to show that they are strong. Otherwise, they're afraid to be beaten by the Republicans for showing their weakness. Uh, but whether or not they act, uh, they probably won't want to prolong any kind of action. So elections will decide what will happen later. And uh, meanwhile, Israel is gambling, uh, hoping that uh, either they scare Iran or they actually provoke a, an escalation because they are afraid of this war of attrition, which has put them in a trap. You see, basically Hezbollah, Syria, uh, Hamas and Iran together and the Houthis have put Israel in a trap and they want to essentially wear them out for years, uh, fighting all the time and destroying their economy gradually because nothing is moving economically in Israel. A lot of companies have closed. The North is empty. 100,000 Israelis have moved to the center as refugees. Another half a million have left the country to go abroad. So, you know, Israel now is in a situation where they are gambling their survival. And that's what's very dangerous. This is very worrying. Uh, of course, as you say, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, many, many Israelis have actually fled the northern border areas uh, because of these attacks by Hezbollah and have moved into, you know, as refugees into hotels and so on and so forth across the country. Uh, so, you know, this is very, very precarious. My last point, Kum, there's a major election coming up in America. And many people believe if Kamala Harris were to win, 
Israel would stop getting the kind of support that it gets from America. And that would, you know, really throw us into the whole world, in fact, into much graver peril. Uh, what do you think about this? You see, uh, right now it's clear that when Netanyahu went to America, his goal was to, number one, test the subservience of the Republicans in the U.S. Congress, which was abundantly demonstrated. They rose 58 times to, greet he, to, to cheer him, even when he was saying nothing special. Uh, but uh, also he wanted to find out what were the attitudes of the two candidates. And you know, the attitudes were quite interesting because, of course, Kamala Harris had to take a fairly... I would say moderate or even slightly pro-Palestinian position in order to keep her left wing uh, with her by saying that one, she couldn't attend his talk and second, she told him that this had to stop, et cetera, et cetera. So he probably didn't get a very good feeling about that. His only hope is that Kamala Harris being very ignorant about foreign affairs and having no definite opinions, she will probably go along with whoever is appointed as her secretary of state and her secretary of defense. Because we all know that during her uh, you know, tenure as vice president, Kamala Harris had really no clue about foreign affairs. She was unable to say an intelligent word. So she certainly will rely on whoever she chooses or whoever is chosen by for her. And I suspect that the neocon, who are mostly Jews, will uh, play a critical role in her cabinet. So in that sense, Israel could get a reassuring message. Trump is an, another very interesting case because he's not at one with the Republicans in his party. And he has picked a Republican who is quite reluctant to involve America in foreign wars and who think that America has to repair its own internal affairs, which are in a very bad shape. So Trump's, uh, you know, America first, in a way goes against a lot of what the Republicans have become, which is Israel first. And even many Democrats are now openly saying that. So... I think Netanyahu has no guarantees from uh, anyone, but he's uh, probably feeling better about Trump getting strong support or even pressure from the Republicans in his party. I mean, the, the senators and the representatives in his party. And as you know, Trump gave him an ambiguous message and said, listen, Israel is losing tremendous credibility and acceptance and sympathy. You people have to stop this. Do the job and get it over with because you are just making a total disaster of your public relations, which was a rather blunt way of saying, you guys have made a mess of it and now most people hate you. So please settle it. And it's interesting if you look at the, uh, you know, the choreography when Trump and Netanyahu were giving a press conference at, uh, you know, Mar-a-Lago, by the way, Trump told him, if you want to see me, you come here. I am not going to go and meet you. So Netanyahu, though he's an acting the prime minister had to go there. And then when the, the press conference took place, Trump basically walked out, leaving Netanyahu alone with the journalist, which was a rather unceremonious way of saying, listen, you deal with him. I am. So I don't know. You know, it's very going to be very interesting what uh, they both do. They all have to take uh, into account uh, their electorate. And a lot of the American electorate is now fed up with Israel. You know, the, the average people who, are, who have no vested interest, who are not multimillionaires, who are not Jewish, or who are not, you know, they basically feel, you know, Israel is a burden, and we have to keep putting money and arms, and we get a bad reputation, and now the youth is revolting in the universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, Israel doesn't have an easy position, and I think the fact that Netanyahu has imposed his presence for the fourth time in the U.S. Congress without getting an invitation is a proof of the control that the Israeli lobby has taken over US policy. You know, no other head of state can go there and say, I'm going to speak to a joint session of Congress and you'll just have to hear me. You know, that it has to come from the White House, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, it hasn't been really a decision of the White House. That's why the vice president did not attend. Truly in uncharted waters in many ways, Kom. Uh, of course, um, you know, there is a lot of sympathy for Israel in one part of the world, that is India, uh, because many Indians, of course, feel that, you know, it, it's the only homeland for the Jews. And if they lose that, you know, it would be a great disaster. Uh, and there is, of course, historic reasons for that. But like I said, that, that we're truly in uncharted waters in many, many ways, Kom. Uh, thanks very much. We were completely out of time. Thanks very much for spending time to talk to us about all these things. Uh, we will have to wait and watch in the coming weeks which way the world proceeds. Thanks very much, Kom Carpentier de Godon. Uh, thanks very much for your time. 
Thanks, Hintal. Pleasure always. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.